A lot of times with projects like this, you have to do a bunch of work before you get to the fun part, but we've actually got the fun part as one of the first things we're going to do. Maybe because I'm jumping the gun because I'm impatient, but in any case, we're going to take the Tesla motor and this week we're going to put it in the Jaguar. We're going to take it right back out because we have a whole bunch of other stuff we have to do, but for this week, it's going in. A key challenge of any motor swap is getting the new motor in the old vehicle. Usually this is a matter of placing the new engine in the old engine bay, cutting away anything that interferes, and just sort of welding up mounts between the frame and the new engine. Sometimes it's easier to carry over the entire subframe. This might be the case if you're shoving a Cadillac engine in a Corvair or something. It's definitely a good idea in my case, as I would love to upgrade the suspension and brakes on this car as well as the motor. In fact, in the future, I suspect you're going to see a lot more subframe swaps than just motor swaps, especially with old vehicles. In any case, the process is basically the same. You take the new motor or subframe and you put it roughly where it will go in the old car, cut away the parts that interfere and weld up some mounts. It was a little more complicated than that in this case for a couple of reasons. The very first step is to remove the old engine and that came with some challenges thanks to the seven foot tall ceiling in my garage. We got it this far before we realized that we didn't have enough headroom to lift it anymore and the engine wasn't high enough. We got it out with some careful garage door manipulation and also letting the air out of the front tires. Another problem is that part where I cut out the parts that interfere. There was quite a bit of interference. The subframe is mounted in four places, so I just have to make some metal go from the frame to these four places, but the Jaguar frame is already at two of those places. In fact, they're trying to occupy the same space at the same time, which I'm fairly sure is illegal. Now, I can cut away the frame in this area, but it requires a lot of removal, which leaves the frame somewhat weakened. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that one of the Tesla control arms is also blowing through the frame. I don't know how Tesla's engineers could have overlooked this, but here we are. So I have to cut away a bunch of the frame to clear the subframe mount and to clear the suspension, but I should be able to reinforce it enough to get the strength and stiffness I need. The subframe has wider mounts in the front and narrower mounts in the rear. If this were reversed, the installation would have been a lot easier. Another oversight by the Tesla engineers. I could have also just installed the subframe backward. I didn't really think of any major reasons why this wouldn't work. There are some considerations, like how the gears in the drive unit are loaded and how the casting handles those loads. Also, tow compliance in the rear suspension might cause some instability at speed. Of course, Tesla designs and tests these motors for driving in reverse, but not necessarily at full power for a long time. Or maybe they do. I don't know. They almost certainly don't do 250,000 miles of durability testing all in reverse. Again, short-sighted on their part. <laughs> You may have noticed that I have all this in CAD models. I'll do a video later on this after I get some more comparison data, but I scanned the car using an Intel L515 LiDAR scanner and some software called RecFusion. It's about 500 bucks all in, which isn't cheap, but the real scanners cost many thousands more. It's pretty good for its price point and good enough for me to draw in the frame, mounts, control arm, and all the other pertinent info. You don't need CAD or a scanner to do this. You can just raise the subframe up slowly and just start cutting and welding until it's in there. This has been the standard approach for a century or so. The frame was originally doing this S-curve thing to go up and over the rear axle. I needed to cut out all this area here, which would make this area super weak. There wasn't a lot of space to reinforce the frame here because the rear seat pan is right in the way. But also, the rear seat is getting replaced. It's also eight times thicker than it needs to be, so I just cut some holes in the bottom of the body under the seat and put my reinforcements where they needed to be. Ew. The new frame design has a much straighter load path. It's probably a better design this way. I didn't do any computer analysis to confirm this, but neither did Jaguar. Let's talk for a moment about what all I'm trying to accomplish here with this added metal. I am, of course, trying to add the four pickup points for the subframe. In doing so, I had to cut away so much of the frame that it needed to be reinforced. That's what this area is doing. I could have probably followed the frame more closely back here, but my coilover shocks are getting mounted to the frame right here. That means this point is supporting the entire weight of this corner of the car. So I added some extra metal up here to up the stiffness. The original suspension was leaf spring mounted here and here with the damper bolted to the frame right about here. So half the spring load and all of the damper load was put into this fat part of the metal frame here, which is pretty efficient. You can think about all the loads that will go between this subframe and the Jaguar frame by just thinking about what a car does. In acceleration, the subframe will be pushing forward. There's also going to be a torque at the wheels. This is illustrated by drag racing cars that pull wheelies. Slowing down is the opposite loads. 
Cornering puts a side load on the four mounts, and going over a bump pushes up at the spring mount. Just look at the design and ask yourself if there's a direct load path for each one of these cases. Mounting the rear of the subframe was pretty easy. There were just two points kind of hanging out in space, so all I needed to do was weld up some metal from the car frame to those pickup points. The rear mounts are not great in acceleration or braking because they're kind of just hanging out down with no triangulation or gussets. I'm not too worried about this because the front mounts are so well constrained in forward and back loading, although I might add some extra little support here. When designing a structure, you usually want your load paths to be as direct as possible. In other words, you don't want to go around a bunch of corners. Corners are bad. They add a lot of stress and compliance. I can't code totally in a straight line here because of the suspension and the body, but this design is pretty solid. The metal supports I'm adding have landings for the rear shock mount. This gives extra stiffness all the way to the mount and also helps locate the upper shock mount on the frame. I also extended the rear all the way back to the supports that hold the rear of the subframe. These holes are kind of just there for extra welding if I have a hard time getting a good weld on the edge. The subframe actually bolts to some steel blocks that are going to be welded in these pockets. The bolts will come in through the bottom and thread into these blocks. I probably could have used some thick wall rectangular tubing instead of solid steel blocks, but whatever, it's fine. I sent a quote out to three water jet places. Advanced Laser and Waterjet came back with the lowest quote, which is pretty great because I've worked with them before and I know they're good at what they do. Shout out to Advanced Laser. A few days later, I had my parts and I was ready to make with the welding. But first, I had to cut away the parts of the frame that were in the way. I used my water jet metal as a template for this. I had left little tabs on the top and the bottom in the front and rear to locate the metal onto the frame. Once I cut the frame out, I had to clean up the frame so I could weld to it. This was not a good time. My grinder kicked up 70 years of rust and dirt and spread it evenly throughout the entire garage, with perhaps a disproportionate amount ending up in my hair and up my nose. I used a mask for this entire thing and I still had rust colored snot. So I got some new, better masks. Anyway, that was clean and I put the metal back on to be welded. I gave a few good welds, or we'll call them acceptable welds. I need to close this section off and also the part on the top as well because it doesn't have much strength in compression. It'll just buckle. Buckling's bad. Buckling's one of those things that separates the engineers from the engineering students. You can do an analysis, I didn't, but you can, that will tell you if this part is strong enough in compression, but it might not tell you that it will crunch up like an accordion. I don't want to weld on this plate because I'm a little worried these pockets are going to be magnets for corrosion. I wanted to make sure I could get access for a good clean and powder coating. So later, I'm probably just going to come back and rivet on some aluminum U-channel. U-channel is like C-channel, but it's sideways. The top will use N-channel, which is like U-channel, except it's upside down. I'll use some coated rivets so I don't have to worry about dissimilar metal corrosion. The subframe will be bolted to these big ass metal plates. Instead of just tapping the steel, I lathed down some nuts to be welded in. The weld might screw up the heat treat and reduce the strength, but we'll try it anyway. Once those were finished, I bolted them to the subframe. That way I can just lift the whole thing up to where it needs to be and then weld it in. Everything's ready to go. So we should be able to just move the subframe into place and... Oh, we need to cut out this little bit of metal here. I was a little worried about this guy, but no problem. We'll just cut him off. And then it should just slip right in well something is preventing us from moving forward oh man it's the old drive shaft i never removed it no problem we'll just move that out of the way and it should just slip right in what is the problem now oh the subframe has some flanges that are rubbing against the frame all right fine we'll scoot it back and cut those out make sure those clear and then it should just slip right in oh come on what the Okay, it's in, finally. I measured the rear of the subframe to make sure its height was correct. After that, a quick measurement on either side to make sure we're centered in the body. And I just welded up those mounts to the frame. 
After that, I cut out and welded up the metal between the frame and the rear support bar. And that was pretty much it. I have a swapped motor. I'm basically done, like 90% finished. Put some wheels on it to check it out. Not bad. Needs more sidewall, but not bad. I like it. Slight issue with the overall width, but uh, I got some ideas for that. We'll figure that out later. Now I gotta take it out so I can finish welding and probably also powder coat the frame. I was hoping to get the front suspension fitted up before I took the frame off, but I'm still waiting on shipping and I still need to fabricate the upper control arms and a few other things, so that'll have to come later. Next time, probably, we're gonna dive into the battery and how to control the motor. I'll tell you how to get the super secret tool that you need to get to get into the Tesla battery. See you then. Car projects are fun, but challenging. You need somebody who's been there, who has all the answers. Hit that subscribe button and I'll let you know when I find that person. Thanks for watching.